Our next speaker is Eric Schweitzer, and uh, up after him will be Scott Podigo. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Eric Schweitzer. I'm with the law firm of Ogletree Deacons in the Charleston, South Carolina office where I've practiced labor and employment law for over 35 years now. Um, in Charleston, we can't say hello in five minutes, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to speak as fast as I can, but I expect I'll, I'll only get partially through the remarks. I'm here representing the Council on Labor Law Equality, with who I'm sure you all are familiar. My partner, Hal Coxon, was planning to be here today and wasn't feeling great this morning, so he sends his regards. I'd like to first quote from President Barack Obama in 2009, quote, the strongest democracies flourish from frequent and lively debate. In my opinion, the proposed amendments uh, don't carry out President Obama's message there. As the United States Supreme Court held recently, in, in fact, in 2008, congressional policy favors uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate on matters concerning union representation, so long as that does not include unlawful speech or conduct, the Chamber of Commerce versus Brown decision. The free speech provisions of Section 8C are dependent on the opportunity to speak limiting the reasonable opportunity for such uninhibited, robust, and wide open speech is the equivalent to denying it altogether. Cutting short, the representation process is an unwarranted curtailment of free speech. In addition, the proposed amendments will severely limit the opportunity for employees who are facing a representation election to conduct their own independent research on the issues and engage in discussion and debate with their fellow employees regarding the results of their research. Second, union files petitions at their peak strength, often after months or longer of quiet campaigning, many times without the employer's knowledge. If unions were required to notify the employer at the outset of their campaign, that would be one thing. But often the first the employer, and quite possibly many of the employees, learn of the campaign is upon receipt of the petition. In fact, I think in the proposed rules, uh, the exp expedited Excelsior list the comments regarding that proposal is to be sure that all employees know what's going on. Third, the requirement that the employer file a statement of position regarding an appropriate unit within seven days, actually five working days, and waive any issues not raised is, is a denial of due process and fundamental fairness. It is certainly not consistent with Rule 26A of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure as the proposal asserts. The rules of federal procedure, uh, as litigators and other rules of federal procedure, do not preclude a party from amending its disclosures at any time, Rule 26C, nor does it prevent a party from raising and litigating any issue about which it learns during the course of the litigation. It is not uncommon for a party to move to amend pleadings to conform the, uh, to the evidence presented, and federal judges are typ typically very liberal in so doing in the interest of fundamental fairness and the administration of justice. I further note that unlike the procedures set forth in Section 9 of the Act and the Board's existing rules in civil litigation for which the federal rules of procedure were crafted, the parties are allowed to engage in broad discovery before going to trial. The purpose of that discovery is to learn the other side's position and evidence and to avoid trial by ambush. Under the proposed amendments, a party's statement of position may not be obtained until the first day of the hearing leaving the other party or parties unable to clearly identify or appreciate the issues to be presented until too late. I, I had one example not, not too terribly long ago where the union representative demanded the hearing. I was ready to stipulate. He subpoenaed 35 or 40 employees from the plant, actually shut down a, a large portion of the manufacturing plant. We got to the hearing and he had no issues whatsoever. Next, the proposed delay of voter eligibility and unit challenges until after the election denies employees of information to cast an informed vote. As one of the previous speakers mentioned, as any, and as experienced labor professionals know, employees many times make up their minds on unionization based not on union propaganda or employer campaigning, but on their own research and the views of their fellow employees who will be in the same bargaining unit. They may or may not want their punitive, putative supervisor or lead man to be in the same unit. They may or may not want to be in the same unit with other job classifications. Denying them that knowledge before the election is asking them to vote for a pig in a poke. 
Also, adding email addresses of potential voters to the information in Excelsior list may seem simply like keeping up with modern technology, but in fact it raises serious legal and practical questions. The board should know that employees will consider it an invasion of their privacy for an employer to disclose their home email addresses and it's unclear whether it's home email addresses or only business email addresses that would uh, be required. Even if the latter, it raises concerns about solicitation on the register guard decision. These are uh, among the many reasons we oppose the proposed new rules. In closing, I would like to quote from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. To curtail free expression strikes twice at intellectual freedom. For whoever deprives another of the right to state unpopular views also deprives others of the right to listen to their views. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my colleagues have questions? Yes. I've got two questions. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Pierce. Um, you, you mentioned that it's problematic for uh, the statement of position to uh, be presented so close to the hearing. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but... Um, My understanding is that's a, a possibility. I know it's requested early, uh, earlier, but uh, I believe in the proposed rulemaking it says it, it has to be there on the first day, preferably to be there earlier. What would be your suggestion in that regard? I, I think having a statement of position is a fine idea. Uh, my concern is not with that requirement, but with the requirement that if during the course of the hearing a party learns of some other issues or, or perhaps uh, one side uh, takes a, a position on the unit that hasn't been anticipated, they should be able to modify, respond, and, and raise other issues. My reading of the proposed rulemaking is you state your position, and then no matter what, that's it, and you cannot present any evidence or otherwise argue anything other than in your statement of position. I think that's too restrictive. I think any legitimate unit issue ought to be the subject of the hearing, whether or not it was stated in that position. If I could follow up on that. Yes. <clears throat> the, that the rules, the proposed rules, more or less equate the statement of position to almost like an answer to a complaint in, in civil litigation. Uh, I wonder if you would comment first on the propriety of uh, utilizing what are essential, ad, essentially adversarial rules, the rules of civil procedure, in what is essentially a, uh, uh, a fact-finding procedure, number one. And number two, to the extent that we are borrowing from the federal civil rules, and that that analogy has any, holds any weight, that, that it's more or less like an answer. An answer is due 21 days after, the, after a complaint is served, but in this instance, we're asking employers to present an answer or be precluded to join issues within five working days. Is that, in your judgment, a sufficient amount of time, and, and, and is, the, is the utilization of the federal rules appropriate in that context? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, that, that's a good question. I would say that if we're going to uh, use some of the civil rules, uh, then I think we should use more of the civil rules than, than just uh, Rule 26. Rule 26 serves a good purpose, uh, disclosure of position uh, of the party. Uh, keep in mind in my, er, in my remarks, though, under those rules there is discovery. There is no discovery in our cases. So I think it's inadequate amount of time to state a position uh, which will be, excuse me, clad in iron and from which you cannot change uh, at any point in time, irrespective of what the other uh, party or parties raise in the hearing. So uh, if we're going to use the rules, the rules of civil procedure, and they work very well for a huge amount of litigation. I'm sorry for doing that. A huge amount of litigation in this country. They work. Uh, it is fair uh, to, to all parties. Let's use all of them, and which would allow for liberal amendment uh, in the interest of justice. Ask I think question. Mr. Becker. Becker. Um, Mr. Babson mentioned the article by Professors Fisk and Malibu, and one of the things that they decry in the article is the board's lack of capacity to do empirical research. Um, in terms of the question of when campaigning begins, you know, we see cases, and that gives us some information, and we do see cases which clearly indicate campaigning is going on before a petition is filed. 
Now, you've indicated uh, that many times um, uh, unions begin their campaigns without the employer's knowledge. Um, are you aware of any um, systematic or semi-systematic um, evidence about how often that occurs or, or you know, when the two parties actually begin their campaigns vis-a-vis -vis the filing of the petition? I can speak, of course, almost only to my own experience. Uh, the the um, underground campaign, if you will, the silent campaign is now uh, the standard. It is very, very rare that we see an open, above board, overt campaign, uh, uh, even in very, very large units. Um, a, a case that I'm familiar with uh, in my hometown, um, there was a union election, the union prevailed. And after they counted the ballots, the, the lead union organizer, a nice gentleman, went up to the, the plant manager and they shook hands and, and uh, he pulled out a photograph and it was of the groundbreaking for the facility which had occurred some years earlier. And this was a totally below uh, the radar campaign, by the way, up until the petition. And he showed it to him and the, of course the plant manager said, yeah, I remember that picture. And he said, well, do you see the two gentlemen in the back waving at the camera? He said, yes. He said, those are our organizers. They've been here for three years. Um, very, very effective. Uh, I also know from my own experience that uh, union organizers are, are very, very capable at isolating groups of employees that will be involved in the campaign and those that will not. A good friend of mine is an ex-union organizer and talked with me about some of the strategies that they employ. So you really have different components. You will have uh, the under-the-radar campaign almost always these days. Small unit, large unit, doesn't seem to make a difference. You will have some group of employees who are not included uh, in any campaigning at all. And, of course, your proposed rules want to get the Excelsior list out much earlier it's in somewhat of a, an acknowledgement of that. Um, Despite what everyone says is the, the high level of sophistication of the employers, many, many times uh, they are totally unaware of the campaign until the petition is actually filed. In the case I mentioned where the gentlemen were waving at the camera at the groundbreaking years before, totally unaware of it until the day before the petition was, was filed. So it seems to be very, very common and no, not all the employees know about it. Thank you, Mr. Schweitzer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.